Welcome to St. John Presbyterian Church. My name is Alan, and I'm the pastor here. And just would like to welcome you, whether you are in person or whether you're watching the rebroadcast at home or wherever you are. Uh, it's good to see some folks back who've been vaccinated. So welcome back. Um, and we just continue to pray that the vaccine rolls out so we can get more and more people here on Sunday mornings. Um, session meets this Tuesday at 6 p.m. You should have received a packet by email, and I imagine you might receive a supplemental packet tomorrow as well. Um, the tax preparation service is here on Thursdays, and if you want more information, you can check the mes message board as you come in and write down the number where um, you can sign up for an appointment. Any other announcements this morning? We keep Dr. Mitchell and his family in our prayers this morning as he is celebrating the life of his mama, as he called her. Um, this morning we'll have music by Nancy, who's going to be sharing our prelude and postlude. And then Rob, Rudy, Jacqueline, and I are going to be leading us in hymns today. So I do want you to stay six feet apart, but know that you can sing along with these songs today. And... Um, uh, just keep your masks on. So let's prepare our hearts for worship as we invite Nancy to share her prelude. God of infinite patience, we call on you once more, knowing that you have every reason to question our coming together. We have worshiped without exception. We have gathered without diligent preparation, as if meeting you laid no requirements on us. Amid the complexities of our lives, we have forgotten to set aside time to be still before you. Sometimes we feel as if we are bitten by snakes all week long, so we assemble here for some relief and healing. Oh God, will you meet us as we are? Amen. Majesty, 
Let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Age to age he stands, and time is in his hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The Godhead three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the lion and the lamb, the lion and the lamb. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Name above all names, worthy of all praise. My heart will sing how great is our God. Name above all names, worthy of all praise. My heart will sing how great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. I will see how great, how great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. All will see how great, how great is our God. The scripture reading is from Luke 16, verses 19 through 31. The rich man and Lazarus. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, 
Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father, Abraham. But if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Let us pray. Lord, open our ears to hear you. Open our minds to know you. Open our hearts to love you. And open our lives to serve you. May the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We stole our dog's name from her sister. When Jacqueline went to the Humane Society, they had two little pups there. One was named Pixie, and the other was named Trixie. Now Jacqueline decided that she liked Pixie better. They bonded a little better, and she had the little darker markings. So Jacqueline liked Pixie, but she also liked the name Trixie. So she ended up bringing home a pixie who ended up being a Trixie. And I'm probably going to have to get my dog therapy one day knowing (laughs) that we did this to the poor thing. Did you know that of all Jesus' parables, Lazarus is the only person, the only character who is named? There are fathers and prodigal sons who are nameless. There are masters and servants who are nameless. And here we have a nameless rich man and a poor man named Lazarus, which means God helps. Lazarus had a name. If Jesus knew it, then everyone knew it. The rich man knew Lazarus' name. Lazarus was the guy with all the sores who hung out at his gate every day. You would have thought that people would have cared more being that they knew Lazarus' name, but in fact, it seems that Jesus names Lazarus to heighten the indifference that people like the rich man showed to him. Because knowing a person's name changes things. I knew the coronavirus was bad, but it didn't really hit home until I knew people who I knew the names of people who were getting sick from it or even dying from it. Then everything changed. It really hit home because I knew the names. If you've ever been around me when I've helped someone, then you know the first question I always ask is, what is your name? That's basic relationship building 101 right there. When you care enough to ask someone's name, it shows from the get-go that you truly do care, or at least you should, because everyone has a name. There are no nameless people on this earth. Every murder victim has a name. Every victim of rape or abuse 
has a name. The child separated from her mother, she has a name. The person pushing a lawnmower down the street with a rake and bags who comes to the church and asks if there's any work, he has a name. His name's Jerry. The man who is pulling a wagon full of his belongings so he can go camp with his friend down by Silver Creek and comes by the church every now and then, his name is James. When we know a person's name, it means that we think they have value. When we choose to know people's names, it shows we care. When we ignore their needs, then perhaps we are more culpable for our own moral failing. We do not live our lives among nameless people unless we choose to ignore them. We live among people who have value and are deserving of our care, people who have names. And ours is the blame when we leave them lying outside our door or at our gate doing nothing. Even though he knew his name, the rich man wouldn't even give Lazarus scraps from his table. It's the bitter, ironic portrait of this man that all he wants is to dine on the scraps that would have been given to the dogs. And yet there we have those same dogs licking Lazarus' sores as if he was the food. Imagine that scene. It's one of the saddest in all the Gospels. This poor man having dogs licking his sores, longing for just a scrap from the man's table. And it shows the extent of the man's indifference for his fellow human being, Lazarus, the man he neglected day in and day out. Abraham Joshua Heschel had this to say. Morally speaking, there is no limit to the concern one must feel for the suffering of human beings. That indifference to evil is worse than evil itself. That is in a free society, some are guilty, but all are responsible. The rich man didn't cause Lazarus's lot in life. But it doesn't seem like he did anything to make it much worse. But then again, he did nothing to make the man's lot better. He was simply indifferent, which, as Heschel said, is even worse than had the man committed evil himself. Heschel also said that we have moral responsibility to other people and that our indifference to need is just as bad as if we had caused it ourselves. One byproduct of Great Banquet Weekends is the Ministry of Leftovers. As you know, these banquets are 72-hour experiences of renewal and awakening where minds and hearts and souls and bodies are literally fed. And with feeding our bodies comes leftovers, which we take down to St. Elizabeth, where there are young women, mothers, and children living there, all with names. And these are more than scraps that we give them. They're expressions of agape love among many that we share on these special weekends. Scraps aren't hard to share, brothers and sisters. And that's all Lazarus longed for. All Jerry ever asked for is a little bit of work. We could give a scrap of food. We could give a scrap of time. One dollar out of our pockets adds up for a person. Scraps can be a big deal for someone. We never know how much. Who knows, those very scraps could have saved Lazarus' life. In 
Instead, both Lazarus and the rich man died on the same day. The latter of which ended up in Hades, the realm of the dead, where he was agonized by flames. He called out to Abraham and said, Send Lazarus to dip his finger in water and cool my tongue. I'm agonizing in these flames. Abraham replied, Child, there is a fixed chasm between you and us, across which none can cross from here or there, even if they wanted to. In the end, the rich man was cut off from God's blessing. He was separated from God, and he agonized over it. It was that hell which Paul described to Timothy when he wrote, He will give justice with blazing fire to those who don't recognize God and who don't obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. They will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the Lord's presence and away from his mighty glory. Eternal separation. And what part of the gospel was it that the rich man didn't follow? Well, as Matthew 25 tells us, he didn't do unto the least of these as if he had done it unto Jesus. In Matthew 25, Jesus said, Then he will say to those on his left, Get away from me, you who receive terrible things. Go into the unending fire that has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Because I was hungry, and you didn't give me a scrap of food. I was thirsty, and you didn't give me a sip of water. I was a stranger, and you didn't welcome me. I was naked, and you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. But then they will reply, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and didn't do anything to help you? Then he will answer, I assure you, when you haven't done it for one of the least of these, you haven't done it for me. Lazarus was hungry. He was covered in sores, lying at the rich man's gate. And the rich man didn't give him a scrap of food. He didn't give him a single bandage to mend his wounds. He was the least of these, and the rich man did nothing. And doing nothing was if he didn't do it to Jesus himself. Now this is where we have to be cautious about our salvation being the result of our actions. For there is grace, but more importantly, there is justice at work in this story. Abraham told the rich man, child, in your life, you had good things. And Lazarus did not. Now he is comforted here, and you are agonized there. God's justice, simple as that. You see, Lazarus had already experienced hell. He experienced hell on earth. He lived it every day of his life. I mean, can you imagine what it would be like covered in sores and starving like that? It was literal hell on earth for Lazarus. In the afterlife, it was just that the fortunes be reversed. And remember, all the rich man had to do was share a single scrap with the man, and he did not. He had been given a chance daily, and yet he did nothing. Do you really think God is unjust for not wanting to spend eternity with such people who in life spent no time with God, no time helping their neighbor? Indeed, the fortunes were reversed, and what hell Lazarus faced on earth paled in the face of what he experienced next to Abraham in heaven. I like how Helen Keller imagined heaven would be like. She said it would be like being in one room where she couldn't see and then moving into another where she could. For Lazarus, he was in one room where he was covered in sores and starving 
And in the next room, he was sitting next to Abraham himself at the great heavenly banquet as the guest of honor, grander than any banquet that the rich man had ever given in his life. That is the promise of eternal life. Not streets of gold or mansions of glory, but being the guest of honor at a heavenly banquet with courses that will never end, lavished with love and blessing and glory for eternity and plenty of scraps for all. We aren't told what Lazarus did that was special for him to share that fate, except that Jesus knew his name and Jesus cared, even when everyone else did not. And that's the overall lesson. This isn't so much a story about ha what happens after we die. It's what we do to bring life to the dead spaces here and now. As we believe God decides what happens to us after we die, but we decide what we do before then. How we live out that prayer that it be on earth as it is in heaven, for all of God's children with names. Sometimes all we have to offer is what we have, even if all we have are scraps. But like a quilt, we see what happens when a bunch of scraps are stitched together with love, sewn together by some divine weaver. Therefore, may Holy Spirit waken us from our indifference, so that whether named or nameless, we might help our fellow humans in need by offering what scraps we have for God to stitch the very fabric of heaven into existence until one day we share it in full at the banquet of the heavenly saints and Christ himself. Amen. Say. 
Rick, no other name. sing no other name Jesus Let us pray. Creator God, we thank you for sending both the rain and the sun to nurture this earth and to make it for us a beautiful garden that you've given for us to keep under our care. We thank you for creating each of us in your image and help us to remember that each person, whether we know their names or not, contains a divine spark within them, the image of you, and that whatever we do to them, it's as if we have done it unto Christ. Christ, our Redeemer, we thank you for becoming human like us, so that you might know what it's like to be tested and tried in every way, but show us how not to sin, but how to hold up our chins and to stand our ground. For not even sin or death can conquer us, because in you we are more than conquerors. Sustaining Spirit, we thank you for giving us energy, intelligence, imagination, and love with which to serve your people. Help us each to live out the calling you have for us, whether it be on the jobs, in the hallways, or here through the church. Almighty God, we lift up the Mitchell family as they grieve. We lift up the Cato family as they grieve. We lift up John as he continues to have test runs. We lift up Gary, who is almost at the end of his treatment. And we lift up Jim um, as he continues to mend from his knee surgery. We ask that you be with our session and give them discernment as they consider how to best lead your church in and to the future that we don't know what it's going to look like. But give us openness and creativity as we learn to live out what it means to be a post-pandemic church when that time comes. Lord, be with our nation and its leaders. And be with those who serve us on the state and local level as well. Be with those who are working on the front lines to continue to curb this illness and be with those who are doing what they can to get people vaccinated. 
Lord, be with those who are struggling just to get by. Be with those like Jerry and James and others who I meet here on a daily basis. Be with those who battle addiction and those who love them. Be with those who battle depression. Be with those who are suffering from suicidal thoughts. Be healing for those who are broken in mind, body, or spirit. Be wisdom for the one who has a decision to make. Be courage for the one facing a trial. Be strength for all of us along the journey. And be peace for the entire world. And now in a moment, I invite my brothers and sisters to offer their prayers to you as well. Give us wisdom to know that your answers come in your way. And patience knowing that they come in your time. Hear us as we pray. Holy Spirit, unite our hearts with all the saints on earth and in heaven as we pray for your kingdom to come, just as Jesus taught us to pray, our Father. Nancy, turn it over to you for the closing prayer. Sorry. <laughs> closing prayer. And please say this with me if you have it on your phones. Loving God, <coughs> who sent Jesus to earth to share our common lot and bring eternal life into our midst, help us to believe and to trust. 
Show us the light of your revelation and help us to welcome its presence in the life of, of this congregation as we gather and when we scatter to our daily activities. May we consciously represent you in all our deeds so that the world may come to a saving knowledge of your grace. Amen. May the light of Christ surround you. May the love of Father God enfold you. May the power of Holy Spirit protect you. And may the presence of God watch over you. And remember, wherever you are, God is and all will be well. Go in peace.